Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chatri. And uh, before I begin, I want to share with you one of my favorite childhood stories that my grandmaster in martial arts uh, told me as a young child. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess in a magical kingdom. She was the fiercest, most intelligent, most kind-hearted, and most beautiful princess of the land. And secretly, the entire kingdom was madly in love with her. They adored her. She had two bodyguards, the fiercest warriors of the entire kingdom, to protect her. They trained their entire lives for 20 years to be able to be in that seat of protecting her. But they were also secretly madly in love with her. They fell in love with her because she's such an amazing human being. One day, the three of them decided to walk behind the castle into the forest. They walk for a few hours. It's a beautiful sky out. The sun is shining. The birds are chirping. The flowers are blooming. They have a, a lot of great time and walking around and laughing and joking. They walk for a few hours into the forest. And then suddenly, it gets a little bit dark. Thunderstorms coming. And out of nowhere, a massive, massive tiger comes out. The tiger is hungry, angry, and ready to eat. The three of them literally freeze out of fear, looking at that tiger. The first warrior looks at the tiger as the tiger inches forward. In his mind, he's thinking, wow, I've never seen something so big so scary, so dangerous. I've been training my entire life for this moment. He looks at the princess and he goes, wow, I'm madly in love with her. She's everything I ever dreamed of in life. He looks at the tiger. The tiger takes another step forward and it's huge and the teeth are coming out and it's ready to eat. In a split second, he runs for his life. The second warrior looks at the tiger and says, I've been training my entire life for this moment. My God, this thing is so much bigger and scarier than I ever imagined. And he is scared out of his pants. He looks at the princess and says, man, but she's everything I've ever wanted in life. She's amazing. I love her so deeply. He looks at the tiger, the tiger inches forward, even now growling and big teeth and ready to jump. In a split second, he pulls out his sword and he fights thinking he's gonna die. He fights to the death. He gets bitten, he stabs the tiger, slashes the tiger, and by pure miracle, he's able to kill the tiger. They walk out of the forest together. She nurses him back to health. And eventually, they end up falling in love and getting married and living happily ever after. Why do I tell you this childhood story of mine? It's literally one of my favorite stories, even to this day. You see, the reality is, a hero and a coward, there is no difference in what they feel. It's what the hero does with that fear that makes him a hero, and it's what the coward does that makes the coward a coward. Now, here's something else I want to say. Whether you like to hear this or not, or whether you believe this or not, or whether you know it or not, there is a coward in all of you, in me, and there is also a hero in all of us. Do we dare to chase our dreams, our passions, the things that really we, 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 we care about, the things we love deeply, the things that are sacred to our soul? Or do we listen to the pressures of society, the pressures of, of losing face or failure, the fear of doubts, the fear, the doubts and insecurities that live in all of us. So every day we have a choice to be the hero of our lives or to be the coward of our lives. I hope to share a little bit of my journey um, with you guys from the very, very beginning. starting with my failures, some of my failures. Who here has failed before? Please raise your hand. Great. 
Wow, awesome. Okay. Well, I can guarantee you that when you see my list of a few of my failures, that I was, I'm the biggest failure here. One thing that I don't like about Asia, and I grew up 18 years in Asia, 18 years in America, and then I came back last several years here, is the fear of failure is pervasive all over. You know what I'm talking about. We care so much about our face as Asians that so many Asians live lives that are hollow and shallow because they want to please their parents, they want to please society, they're in jobs with nice big titles, but they don't really love what they do. So I want to share a few of my failures. So I was the kid in school who got suspended for fighting, a really naughty boy, and my mom was always in the principal's office. I was also the student with mediocre grades. I just was a very playful, rebellious guy, so I was doing sports, martial arts, chasing girls, whatever, anything but not, uh, except for studying. <laughs> then in university, I was actually caught by the police and, and, uh, for a, a prank. So I was living in America at the time, and uh, I had uh, seven other housemates. And the, the females lived on the second floor and the males lived on the first floor. And I thought that would be a funny idea if at two in the morning we put um, baking powder or flour on our face and put a towel and then get a ladder up and, and scare the girls. And, and then, but the funny thing is we climbed up to the roof and then the girls heard all the noise and they called 911 or whatever, the police, you know, I didn't know. And then it's so it's silent. And all of a sudden we're stuck on the roof, powder on our faces. And then there's like five police cars down there saying, get down. You know, like, so that's, uh, that's me. Um, I got disowned by my father. Um, probably the toughest time in my life uh, was during the Asian financial crisis. You know, my, I, I, I grew up in a, a well-to-do loving home until the Asian financial crisis hit, or a few years before, my father went bankrupt and eventually abandoned the family. And leaving my mother and my younger brother to, our, to fend for ourselves, and that's when we lost everything, you know, uh, we didn't even have a house to live in. I'll get more to that story later on. I've been broke with no money, with literally no money, lost my face and everything. When I left Thailand many years ago, I thought that I would never return back to Asia because we left in shame, embarrassment, sadness, and poverty. I've been miserable and depressed and unfulfilled at different points in my life. I started a company that failed and had to be sold. I've been overweight, unhealthy, and out of shape as well at different points in my life. I've had a temper problem my entire life, and thank goodness for martial arts, otherwise I'd be really uh, a loose firecracker. I've gotten fired from a job before. And I've had different points in my life where I felt like a total loser, um, especially when I was struggling in poverty, very embarrassed and ashamed. And I've suffered through heartbreak from a divorce. These are some of my failures. But I also want to say something that if we all learn to embrace failure, as a wonderful opportunity to learn, to grow, to evolve, then good things can happen. You see, if we run from failure, if we deny that we failed, we won't learn from those experiences and we won't be better. The whole point of us, of this reality, the, the whole point of, of uh, all of us is that none of us are perfect. We're all works in progress, even today and every day. There's always a way for all of us to get better and better and better as human beings, as fathers, as mothers, as children, as business executives, as leaders, as managers, whatever it is in life, we all have the opportunity. So here are a few of the outcomes because I chose to embrace failure as a wonderful opportunity for me to learn and become better. I became a martial arts instructor. I became an entrepreneur. I earned an MBA from Harvard Business School, living on one meal a day, four dollars a day. My mother lived with me in the dorm room secretly, without the school knowing, so we had a really small, tiny dorm room. And my mom slept on the bed and I slept on the floor. And she had to wait for me in between classes because you had this card pass to get into the dorm. And we had to do this uh, in my second year because she had nowhere else to live. Through a lot of luck and blessings in life and perseverance, I, I ended up starting my first company when I was 27. 
and became financially independent when I was in my early 30s. So I've been supporting my mother financially since I was my, in my mid-20s. I joined the board of directors of Project Sunshine, which is one of the world's largest volunteer organizations focusing on helping terminally ill kids with cancer and HIV. I helped to pay for my brother's university education. I built a $500 million hedge fund on Wall Street. I became chairman of a $1.5 billion company. I founded the, the chain of martial arts academies, the, the largest chain of martial arts academy in, in Asia. The two of the world champions that you see uh, are teach there. I competed in professional fights in Muay Thai. I've been doing martial arts my entire life. So I've been doing martial arts since I was a kid in Thailand. And I still train every day. So it's about 33 years now that I've been doing martial arts. I travel to over 200 cities in 50 countries. I make it a point to try to travel every year to two new countries um, so that I'm, I'm seeing the world, not just working, but I'm seeing the world and experiencing cultures and experiencing different ways of life and different ways of thinking. I really like that whole uh, you know, open source leadership concept because I really believe in that uh, wholeheartedly that the next generation of leaders who lead, this, who lead Asia, you guys, who lead uh, Malaysia, we all have to be worldly. We all have to learn different styles of leadership, different knowledge bases, and different experiences and share that so that we can lead as the world globalizes even further. No, oh, it's stuck. I built Asia's most uh, decorated professional fight team Muay, with world champions in Muay Thai, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, boxing, uh, mixed martial arts, uh, submission grappling, wrestling. Um, I launched the world's largest online university for martial arts so that everyone in the world, 24-7, 365, could learn martial arts and learn to defend themselves. Um, I launched this company uh, several years ago, and the idea was very simple. I thought, you know, why should if you were born and raised in a small little village in India, why can't you learn as a woman to protect yourself? You have actually no access. So if I create this online university with my world champions, that they would democratize martial arts all over the world and self-defense. Um, I'm an entrepreneur in, in residence at INSEAD, one of the world's top business schools. I'm founder and CEO of Asia's largest sports media property, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Well, that journey has been uh, very, very difficult. And then just yesterday, I was awarded uh, Asia's top CEO by Deloitte, um, an influential brand. Thank you. <laughs> and today, I own several companies. I don't share my failures and my successes to brag or to garner sympathy, but I want it to use. At, I want to use my story as inspiration. You see, when you. Look at the media and stuff. They only put the good stuff. They don't want to talk about all the bad stuff that has happened in my life. But the reality is I want to share with that, that, this journey with you because no one is perfect. We all screw up. We all fail. We all make mistakes. But the question is, what do we do with that? So a lot of people say, hey, man, how the hell do you do this? How the hell do you go from living on $4 a day to doing something that you love in life that can help many, many people. I've been very lucky in, the for, in that I um, have a blessed with the opportunity of speaking all over the world, but also meeting a lot of people from all over the world from my businesses. And one thing I see is this. Most people, unfortunately, live a broken life. And what do I mean by this? When we're young and little kids, if we take a risk and we fail, what happens? Our parents come down on us, our friends, our society, the structure around us. So when we fail, we start to feel bad. We're like, man. And even you know, when I was a kid, the same thing. My mom is a Japanese lady, a very conservative lady. And despite me being a total screw up, I mean, even if I just got a C, my mom would be very, very upset at me. So we all learned to fear. And now we're risking failing, feeling bad, and learning fear. So what do we do? We decide, man, the next time, forget about it. I'm going to avoid risk. I got my heart broken with this beautiful, amazing woman. 
and therefore I don't want to ever love again. This is the lessons that we all learn when growing up. So what happens? We learn to hide. We learn to hide behind fancy degrees, fancy titles, fancy whatever. But are we really listening to our souls? Are we li really listening to our inner energy? So you never take a risk and you never realize your potential and you're in this, con this downward spiral of believing in your fears, doubts, and insecurities. Without even knowing it, you end up becoming the coward of your life. And this is something that all over the world that's universal. Been very lucky to speak at so many different companies and universities, and this is what I see. But on the flip side, when I was in my darkest moments, what I would do for inspiration, I would read a lot of autobiographies of successful human beings. And I don't mean successful because of money. I mean successful in any field. The best musicians, the best uh, you know, social activists, the best entrepreneurs, whatever it was, I wanted to read about what, was, what do the very, very best people in the world, what do they do? Sports, music, anything. And this is the cycle. After studying it very, very closely, Successful people, they take risks. They fail. But rather than feel bad about it, decide to embrace it as a learning experience for the next part of their life. I failed so many times in my life. Actually, I still fail every day today, honestly. To win my companies, I make so many mistakes, and I'm probably, like worst, probably the worst boss possible, <laughs> you know, because I'm always making mistakes. You embrace it so you can learn and improve. And when you learn and improve, you're setting yourself up for the next stage of your life. So you learn to embrace risk. And then you may succeed or you may fail. It doesn't really matter. Because you're going to relish it and you're going to go back on that cycle of learning and improving. So you're constantly on this cycle of risk taking, of being out of your comfort zone. Daring to fail so that you can achieve greatly. Risking what you have had done in the past so that you have a better future. So I want to share five key life lessons uh, from my journey um, with some stories behind it. The first lesson I say is love. I know it sounds so corny and trite, but the most successful people in the world, they genuinely love what they do. Genuinely. And why is love important? You're like, oh man, but who cares? You know, I'll just tell you my own personal journey, okay, about love. I love martial arts. It is my greatest passion in life. It is my greatest passion in life. When I started One Championship, the video you saw, for the first, I started that about six years ago. For the first three years, I was rejected by everybody. Nobody wanted to come work with me. The governments didn't want to even talk to me. Broadcasters didn't want to air my content. Sponsors and advertisers did not want to be associated. I was rejected thousands of times. Literally, if I got my emails and I printed them all out, it would be like a library. But because I loved it so much, I'm like, I believe in it so much. I just want to celebrate Asia's greatest cultural treasure, martial arts. And I want to celebrate the deep-rooted Asian values of integrity, humility, kindness, courage, discipline, work ethic, honor, and respect. So whenever I was in my darkest moments, I love what I do. I'm like, I love it. I can't help it. I love it. One of my low points was my mom called me. And she said, like, Chachri, because she was really against me starting a martial arts career you know, in terms of my uh, work life. Because at the time, I owned a $500 million business on Wall Street. And I was, you know, I wear a suit every day and tie. And my mom liked that. <laughs> it's all mom, right? <clears throat> so my mom calls me and, she, and I said, Mom, you know, it's three years in and nothing's happened. And my mom's like, you see? I told you, you should listen to mommy, you know? But I love it. So I hung up the phone, I felt terrible because my mom was, you know, saying I basically ruined my career, and, but I love what I do. And so I kept on persevering. If you look at those world champions, okay, what does it take to be a world champion? I, I'm in a funny, funny seat in my job. I deal with world champions every day. I deal with people who can kick my butt every single day if they wanted to, okay? And yet I have to lead them. 
okay? So those guys you saw, they could literally kill me in two seconds. Those guys, <clears throat> it takes, they trained six hours a day, six days a week for 20 years, just for the right to be able to have the skills to be, potentially become a world champion. Imagine that, six hours a day, six days a week of hard, hard training. They run typically 24 kilometers a day in addition to their hard training. They have hundreds of fights. They have broken bones, they have, I mean, concussions. They've had, it's just a very tough journey to become a world champion. Look at me, I love martial arts. I trained six hours a day before, but when I started losing, it kind of killed it for me. So it shows you the difference between a world champion and a advanced martial artist. But that's the same analogy for all of us in life, right? Let's take, a, let's, take a, let's take an extreme. I want everyone here to think about something they really, really hate to do. So for example, me, I hate filling out application forms and I hate standing in long lines, okay? <laughs> So I want everyone to think about something, I, the, the thing that you hate to do, something like that. Like, I don't know, maybe cleaning toilets or whatever it is. What do you hate to do, okay? If I said to you, okay, from now on, I want you to do it six hours a day, six days a week, and I want you to do it for the next 20 years. There's no way I can stand in line for six hours a day. I mean, there's no way I can fill applications out. I would quit. At some point, I would quit. That's the same logic for love. When you love something so deeply and you care about so much, no matter what obstacles are in front of you, no matter what setbacks, no matter what failures, you will persevere because you love it. Because you're having fun, you enjoy it. So that's my first lesson. The second lesson <clears throat> is that success leaves clues. If you want to be a phenomenal leader, identify leaders in the public domain or in your own life that you want to emulate. Learn the lessons from them. If you want to be a multimillionaire, go find a multimillionaire. Go emulate the lessons. Success leaves clues. If you can find mentors who have achieved what you want to achieve, they've already achieved it. They know the road. They know the path. And if they share that knowledge with you, it will accelerate things and cut down your risk. And most likely, you'll be able to achieve it. You want to be the world's best doctor? Go find the best doctor in your city or in your country. Find out how they did it, he or she did it. I really believe that mentors are a way to accelerate success in life. <clears throat> Next, I always say to my team, everyone who works with me, to unleash your greatness in life, you must surround yourself with greatness. What do I mean by that? All of us, we are actually the average of the five people with whom we spend the most time, okay? So imagine if your five best friends got drunk every night and did nothing. You eventually would get drunk every night and do nothing. So every day I train, believe it or not, I train with these world champions every day. They're way better than me. But because I'm surrounded by these lions, it, wants, it makes me a lion. I mean, I look at them like, man, I get my butt kicked every day. I got to improve. I got to improve. That mentality is, I really believe, whatever environment you put yourself in. And here's the thing. Most human beings, most of us, will tend to be, try to put ourselves in environments where we feel safe and comfortable. So, of course, it's easy for me, as a martial artist, to be training with people who are, who are worse than me. Because then I feel good, I'm safe, no one, I'm not going to hurt, nothing, you know, it's, it's, I'm comfortable. As opposed to I train every day with people who are much, much, much better than me. I do it because then I'm always insecure, I'm, I, I, have, I have a sense of like, wow, I got to improve, I got a sense of like, being around these amazing human beings, it gives me inspiration to be the best I can be. The next one I always say is 1% uh, to my entire team, all, all my companies, all the people who work with me. Every day, try to improve yourself 1% at whatever you do, whatever it is, your job, as a father, as a mother, as a sister, as a brother, as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, as a leader, whatever it is, improve yourself 1% a day. Why do I say that? After 70 days, if you take a dollar and you, improve, and you compound that by 1% uh, a day for 70 days, that $1 becomes $2. Now, of course, it's not a 
it's not a, a, a mathematical perfection in terms of, because we're human beings, we don't know if we're really improving 1% a day or 5% a day or half a percent a day. But that mindset of waking up in the morning and saying, I want to improve myself. What can I learn today? What can I do today? As opposed to a mindset of, oh, I already know what my job is. I already know da 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 Pushing yourself. And the last lesson I say is, life is just a fight. It's a fight for our dreams. It's a fight for our loved ones. It's a fight for getting into the university of our dreams. It's a fight for finding the love of our life. It's, the, it's a fight for uh, keeping a relationship together. It's a fight for your next promotion. So I always say, you have to learn to be unbreakable. You have to have a warrior spirit and promise yourself that no matter what happens in your life, you will conquer adversity. And, and this was, I can tell you, through my thousands of martial arts, thousands of hours of martial arts training. When I was in my darkest days, living on $4 a day, one meal a day in America, I remember a couple of times when I wanted to quit. A couple of times I, I, you know, I was crying and I would break down because my mom was crying and she was living in my dorm room and, and uh, you know, if you're a son, you'd never want to see your mother cry um, out of hopelessness for her kids, but also, you know, it was just, uh, at the time, very difficult. But at that moment is when you decide what you're going to do. You see? Here's the, here's the funny thing about life. When you're successful, it's very easy. Life is easy. Everything is easy. Anybody can be successful. But the defining moments of our lives is what we decide to do, what we say to ourselves in our worst moments in life. In our worst moments in life. So when I was, I remember specifically, I was crying because I just talked to my mother and she was crying and I was by myself because you know, I didn't want to show my mom that I was crying. But I also remember that was the last time I cried because I was crying and I was like, man, like, I can't believe this is my life and, and I might be poor for the rest of my life. This is before I went to Harvard at that point. And, or it was around that time. And I said to myself, there is no way in hell I'm going to let my mom down. There's no way in hell. There's no way in hell I'm going to let my younger brother down. I am going to be unbreakable. So I think that is something that, you know, no matter what it is in your life, and, and here's another thing too, everyone thinks that other people's lives are easier. That's not true, man. Everyone has adversity. Everyone has suffering. Everyone has tragedy. Everyone has bad luck. But what are we going to do with that? Are we going to sit there and blame the world? And woe is me and cry? Or are we going to go out there and do something about it? Are we going to be unbreakable for our dreams? <clears throat> so I want to share also some, some lessons from my entrepreneurship journey um, that I think might be relevant. For, I'm sure some of you are entrepreneurs or think about doing your own company one day in the future. Ikigai is a Japanese concept. Ikigai in Japanese means your reason for living. Okay. Too many of us, okay, all over the world, all over the world, buy a house, buy a car, and work to pay that off. Work to pay that off. Too many people buy nice clothes, nice things to impress people they don't even care about. Think about that concept. People work so hard to buy clothes and cars and houses to impress people they don't even care about. Ikigai is a very profound thing. Everyone has an ikigai. This is Japanese belief. Ikigai, everyone has a reason for being on this planet. Everyone has a reason for living. Everyone has a purpose. It takes a long, long time and hard, hard thought and deep introspection for you to find it. Examine your successes, your failures, examine your strengths and weaknesses. But if you can find something you love, something you're good at, something the world needs, and something you can be paid for, you will be living the life of your dreams. Just like I feel very blessed that I'm able to do something that I absolutely love. I happen to be pretty good at it. The world needs it, and I can make money from it. 
So every day, honestly, people say, I, I, my schedule, I work seven days a week, 16 to 18 hours a day. I'm flying all over the world all the time for my companies. People are like, how do you do it? Why do you do it? You know, it's like, I found my ikigai. You see, through one championship, when you look at that video and you think the action or these guys, you think, oh, it's just about fighting. No, actually for me, one championship is not about fighting. We are broadcast in 128 countries, a billion homes around the world. My superheroes have a massive influence over society, over children, and what they think and their values. So internally at one championship, I say our mission is to un unleash real life superheroes who ignite the world with inspiration, hope, dreams, and strength who celebrate the values of integrity, courage, discipline, honor, respect, the deep-rooted Asian values. That is my ikigai. Because if I make another 100 million or another billion or whatever it is, it's not going to change my life. I'm actually quite simple. I have a few hundred dollar watch. I wear a t-shirt like this. I wear, I wear uh, normal sneakers like everyone else. I don't have any material needs or material desires. But what I have a need for is to feel that somehow... You see, all of us, the fact that you're all sitting here, we are actually the lucky ones in life. We are the chosen ones by the universe, by God, by Allah, by whoever. We are the chosen ones because we are leaders and future leaders. So by definition, we have the ability to change the world, to make it a better place or to make it a worse place because we're leaders. But the fact that you're actually in this room, it means you already won. It's about what are you going to do with it. So for me, I look at it, I'm like, I own Asia's largest sports media property. What am I going to do with it? I want to do good. I want to know that millions of children all over Asia have posters of my heroes. And those heroes inspire with their incredible life stories, but also inspire because they live and exemplify deep-rooted Asian values that we celebrate and hold dearly as a continent. So the K-State One Championship, I launched it in 2011, so six years ago. Today, it's Asia's largest um, sports media property. Expected valuation in the next six months is going to be a billion US. And we will be on track to uh, be a multi-billion dollar property. So we are on track. When I started One Championship, I had a very simple thesis. I looked at every region of the world, and I saw every region of the world had multi-billion dollar sports media properties. What do I mean by that? North America had NBA, has NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball. Europe has English Premier League, F1, Champions League. And they're all worth several billion to 40 billion dollars a piece. You come to Asia, before one championship, there was nothing. Nothing on a Pan-Asian basis. There was uh, cricket in India, IPL. There's Japanese baseball. Then there's a couple of local leagues in each country. But nothing to unify 4.4 billion people. Then I said, man, but Asia is the home of martial arts for 5,000 years. There is a martial art in every single country that is part of the history, the tradition, the culture, the values of society, the bedrock. Japan has karate, Korea has taekwondo, China has kung fu, Russia has sambo, Malaysia has silat, Thailand has muay thai, um, Philippines has kali. The list goes on and on. So I said, I'm going to try this thing. And then I called my mom and said, Mom, I'm going to retire from Wall Street. And I'm going to go chase martial arts. <laughs> and my mom said, Chatri, do not do such a thing. Because she likes me in suits and neckties. <clears throat> She's a conservative Japanese lady. And she said, Chatri, do not do it because martial arts and fighting, that's a mafia business. And she was afraid that I was going to get killed by the mafia or whatever. <clears throat> or that people would think I was mafia. <clears throat> How did I pull this off in six years? <clears throat> Five things. First, as I said to you guys about love, passion. Man, I love martial arts. That's everything to me in my life. I do it. I live it. I breathe it. This is what I love. But you know what's funny is... I did many other things in life before coming to martial arts because I thought I had to fit into my parents' expectations or my mother's expectations or society or whatever it was. But here's kind of a sad story. 
um, in the sense that I climbed to the top of Wall Street. I owned a $500 million business, making millions a year. And I was depressed inside, and I was lonely. And I remember very, very, one day I remember, the year just ended, I'd made a crap load of money. And I was happy. Then I went downstairs to the sushi restaurant by myself. And I'm sitting there e eating. And I'm like, but tomorrow a new year begins. It's gonna be January. And I'm like, man, I, I just, ah, uh, I felt so down. And I'm like, that's so, that's so messed up. I mean, how can I go from poverty to making millions and be depressed? I'm like, how is that possible? I'm like, this is, I didn't understand the, the, the concept of ikigai at that point. I just thought, naively, when I was poor, how can I end my mother's suffering? How can I take my brother, how can I pay for my brother's school? I thought money was the answer to ha happiness. I genuinely thought that. So I climbed up to the top of the mountain and I realized it's a damn wrong mountain. I'm like, holy cow, how am I going to get down? But I'm grateful that somehow, somewhere, I had the guts to say no to my mom, no to my friends. So literally, when I decided to retire and do this martial arts stuff, my family and friends, everybody, everybody said, you're crazy, you're stupid, don't do it, you're ruining your life, you're successful, don't, don't do it. You've forgotten your days of poverty, you've lost gratitude. But I start off with passion. The second is value proposition. I just explained to you, right? There was no sports property ever in the history of Asia. I want to unite it. 4.4 billion people so we can celebrate Asia's greatest cultural treasure together. We can have superheroes who, who make a positive impact on society, on the world. This is what I wanted. Then the market opportunity. I saw 4.4 billion people. Man, if everyone's a fan, it's going to be a massive property. The team, I hired the very, very best. I'm sorry, I'm speaking fast because I'm almost ending out of time. The team, uh, what I did was I recruited from around the world. Remember what I said about greatness? Surround yourself with greatness in order to unleash your greatness. So I hired people, the best of the best people, executive producers, head of marketing, all that stuff, from F1, from, from Red Bull, from America, and I convinced them to come move to Singapore to, to uh, work on this project with me. And of course, execution. It's one thing to dream and have a PowerPoint. It's one thing to do and accomplish every single day. But that's the whole 1% thing. Because I have a, a mentality of 1% a day, my entire company, everyone who works for me, has that same mentality. When we have that same mentality, we'll be pushing forward as opposed to just coasting. Last thing is five key entrepreneur success factors that help me that if you ever think about doing your own startup or doing your own business, one is the foundation of every great person, every great company, every great country is the foundation of integrity, bar none. If you just look at throughout history. And I don't mean success meaning, oh, how much money you have. I mean success meaning a human being who's unleashed his or her potential, a human being who has made his or her mark on the world and has done good and helped and in some small way made a difference in the lives of others. So I always tell my team, very simple rule, guys. Live your life in a way that would make your mom proud, even if she knew all of your worst moments. So whenever I make mistakes, I think, or if I'm going to lose my temper, I think, oh, my mom is standing right next to me. <laughs> I better behave, right? But it's a good barometer, because you want to live your life to make your parents proud. So I always say, do the right thing, even if no one is watching even if no one is watching. And I hire for that, so I look for those traits. The next thing I think a, a successful entrepreneur must have, he or she must have, is the ability to attract resources above and beyond their, their current resources. Meaning, what do I mean? How did I convince my first 100 employees to join me with one championship when everyone in the world said it was a stupid idea? Literally. I mean, even when they talked to their families, said, oh, I'm thinking about joining this new young company called One Championship. Their families were like, you're stupid. That's crazy. That's a martial arts. That's fighting. That's mafia. The guys, no, don't do that. But if you're an entrepreneur, you're able to spread that passion. If you're a leader, whatever your mission is, that's a very important thing is can you attract resources? Can you attract people to follow your vision, to follow your mission? 
in a way that they believe in that vision and that mission as deeply as you do, right? It's one thing to be a boss. A boss is you do this, you do that. A leader can ignite inspiration in the hearts and minds of his or her team that he or she serves. <clears throat> Another very important thing as an entrepreneur, but also very important for a leader, what culture do you set? I think, oh, but what is culture? What's the big deal? It's actually a huge deal. For me, culture is the engine of performance. You see, if people go to work and they're happy and they feel fulfilled and they love their colleagues, they love their bosses, they love their teammates, it brings out the best. I always say happiness is the most productive force. Most people, sadly, they go to work and they're before on Sunday night, they're dreading going to work. And if any of you are dreading on Sunday night, then you should re-examine some things. <laughs> I'm told me to be offensive, but that's you should be as a leader inspired to on Sunday night. You can't wait to see your team. And if you do your job and spread happiness, <clears throat> If you do your job right, you develop a great culture, the team will do wondrous things for you. So I really spent a lot of time building culture, nurturing culture, nurturing my team. And of course, I mentioned before, execute, right? It's all about speed of execution. It's one thing to have a PowerPoint presentation. It's one thing to get things done in, into action. Then the last thing I would say is, going back to the whole failures, the greatest people the greatest teams, the greatest companies, the greatest countries. Darwin once said, or wrote, hypothesized, which I wholeheartedly agree with, it is not the fast, it is not the strongest or the smartest that survives. It is the one who adapts to change most efficiently. If you learn, improve, grow, and evolve every day, and your team does the same, you will be able to adapt to market conditions, to competitors, to consumer changes, whatever it is. So those are the five success factors, I would say. The last thing I want to leave everyone here with is, again, we are the lucky ones. We are the blessed ones in life. For whatever reason, you're sitting where you're sitting, through good fortune, through good luck, through your abilities, to your hard work. But I want you to think of this as a beginning in your life. Today is a beginning of your life. I don't care if you are CEO or not, you're a VP or some hotshot. All of us, we should all adopt that this is the beginning. Today is the first day of my life. I can improve, I can grow, how I can make an impact on the world. You see, I don't think we were born just to buy a nice house or buy a nice car or buy nice clothes. I genuinely believe that we were born on this precious earth to unleash our potential so that we may give back to the world more than we receive from it, so that we can change lives, so that in our time here, in our 70, 80, 70 or 80 years here, we will all know as leaders that we have done good, that we have given opportunity, that we have inspired the world and made it a better place. Thank you very much, guys.